value. And I think that's why this term ecosystem services has grown in popularity because we know we pay for internet services, we pay for telephone services, right. pay for medical services and health services, we pay for police and ambulance services, we pay for many, many services. Most of our paycheck goes to the services we get. Tax is a form of paying for government services. We never pay for the services that plants, animals, and microorganisms provide. It would be interesting if they were to form a union and send us a bill and how much <laughs> they would charge us for everything they do for us. I have a feeling we couldn't afford it. Right. Um, that's interesting. And, and the payments for ecosystem services uh, concept is definitely making headway into the economics um, community as well, I'm, uh, from my understanding. And, and probably it seems like the whole carbon climate change issue is, is getting a big foot in the door like you say, upon which we can start adding, layering in these other services, not just carbon. Well, we just um, had a graduate class at Columbia where the students an actually analyzed payment for ecosystem service programs from around the world. Okay. And the ones which were the most advanced and well-structured, that was our question, how, how well-structured are they, were the carbon, paying for carbon, paying for carbon storage, paying for carbon sequestration. And, and why was that? I think that's interesting because it was very clear what the economic benefits of payment for ecosystem services right. in that case um, was. Uh, we found that payment for ecosystem services for water or for biological diversity or other services were not nearly as well developed and needed a little bit more time before they had good programs. But I think you can see you're absolutely right that ecosystem services is growing really, really fast right. as a way of understanding what nature provides for human well-being. Because the concept of services is very clearly understood from an economic perspective. Things like nitrogen cycling or sulfate reduction doesn't mean much to an economist, but yeah. services do. <laughs> yes. So I was interested in something you said about, um, about the project. You said that some parts of ecosystem service projects other than carbon-related ones were not very well developed. Do you mind uh, elaborating a little bit on, on what was it the science that wasn't as well developed, or was it the links between the science and, say, policy-relevant outcomes, or the economic modeling of that, or the valuation of that? What, what parts were, were not sufficiently well developed? Well, the purpose of our class was actually to look at the scientific foundation of most of these programs and okay. ask whether or not they had a, a solid, we didn't expect anything sophisticated, but they have a solid and largely correct scientific foundation. Sure. And what we found was that carbon was very well um, structured by notions of carbon cycling and what their influence was on climate. Um, whereas when we went to something like water or biological diversity, it turned out that the science behind them was not very well developed. Um, hmm. They didn't have a really good understanding of what should be monitored when you set up these payment free ecosystem services, how long you should monitor them, um, what are the elements that could lead to, lead to instability or stability in the system. Um, it really uh, needed a lot more work in many of these other systems. Now, on the other hand, these programs were invariably smaller and involved much less in the way of uh, uh, funds moving through them. With sure. carbon, we have the voluntary carbon market. We have a lot of money that's playing into this and a lot of research that's going on as well. Biological diversity, sad to say, because it's my favorite topic, yes. we're, we're among the worst because people really struggled even with defining what they meant by biological diversity. Exactly. And in many cases, they were focusing on saving a few species which were of ecotourism value, which didn't actually constitute the proper way an ecosystem service would be structured. Right. Um, but these are the things that can be fixed. It was our goal to try to draw attention to the need to improve the scientific foundation for ecosystem service programs, because ecosystem service programs are supposedly guided by science and will work best if they actually pay attention to the science behind them. Absolutely. So, going back to something you just said now about, about biodiversity probably being, let's say, the least well operationalized among the Payments for Ecosystem Services uh, project types. I mean, we've actually had a discussion about this before in your office, and I remember you characterized this really nicely, and it stuck with me. Um, you said that the situation with biodiversity loss is it's sort of like we're flying a plane, and a plane that we didn't even design. We kind of picked it up from somewhere. I think the analogy was, was Russian um, fighter pilots or something. And basically, we're flying the plane, and we're throwing out pieces one by one, not really knowing what, what they do and how they interact. Um, and probably tying that back to the payments for ecosystem services idea, it's, I guess it's hard to uh, quantify a service value to something again, where it's hard to even identify who is doing the service provision. 
Well, I remember sense. my conversation with you was a very it was a very long and entertaining one, <laughs> and, and the analogy um, uh, uh, was one that was first put forward by Paul and Anne Ehrlich from Stanford University. Oh, is that right? Okay. And they describe species as rivets in an airplane. Okay. And they said you're sitting in a plane, you know, in your seat, looking out the window, and suddenly you see a rivet pop out of the wing, and you're not terribly alarmed because there are lots of rivets in the wing. Sure. But as more and more rivets pop out, right? Given that it's a machine that's flying, and your life is in this, the hands of this machine. You might become concerned, even if you don't actually know what the engineering uh, significance of losing rivets are, but maybe we should do something to stop the loss of rivets. Um, what happened with biodiversity and ecosystem services was that we modified that initial idea to saying that you're losing parts of a system whose role you don't really understand. So we're not just looking at species as sort of pegs holding together a machine, I see. but actually parts that perform some function. So we might argue that in an airplane it's fairly clear but if you lose the pilot and the co-pilot as well, this is not very good. <laughs> right. If you lose the navigator, that's not very good. If you lose the landing gear, that's not very good. If you lose the coffee pot and the coffee machine, that's okay. Right. Um, and so when you look at the possibility of losing 50% of Earth's species in the next 50 years, the question is, you know, how many of them represent sort of like the coffee pot we can live without versus the pilot or co-pilot or landing gear or right. some of the things which might control things like the rudders and the ailerons. Um, and, and that makes us worry that our system isn't just falling apart because rivets are falling out, but actually functioning systems are beginning to fall apart as well, like you lose your navigation system. And um, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like necessarily comparing nature to uh, machines because we always view culturally machines as being these cold, hard, engineered systems, sure. and nature as being something more sort of warm and natural and... and, and, and um, I don't know, organic. Right, and it um, seems that uh, implications about whether nature should be serving humans, too. When right, we, when and that, that's another thing. Um, I think within my community of scientists, we don't have a problem with asking questions about whether nature uh, should serve humans. I think in part we feel that if nature is going to serve humans well, it's probably going to require a lot of biological diversity. So we're not too concerned about where it's directed. Right. Um, um, you know, it, it, there are people who feel that uh, we should be worried about saving nature in, for their intrinsic value, independent right. of whether or not humans have value for them or not. And even economists are quite split. I remember that a lot of economists don't agree that in the idea of intrinsic value, whether humans were here or not, yeah. something that still have a value, is a controversial idea that not all economists agree with. It Yet is. there are many people who feel that nature has a tremendous amount of value, even if humans weren't working around to, to observe it or to appreciate it. Yeah, it's definitely um, a contentious issue, uh, and it and it tends to. I'm, I'm I'm sure you've experienced this too in classrooms or wherever, but it tends to incite a lot of emotion among the participants. I've I can't. I mean, you know, I can remember so many instances where we had a great discussion about I don't know the economics and the ecology of red reducing emissions from deforestation. Then someone mentioned something about including the intrinsic value of biodiversity and some Red Plus program, and all of a sudden the room was divided uh, in a way that just was not, it just did not seem reconcilable. Uh, I don't know if you've experienced something like that before. Oh, yes, I've had classes sure divide 50-50 right down the middle. <laughs> yeah, and it's, and it's very um, irreconcilable. But on that point, actually, so something that I read recently um, by someone named Brian Norton, I don't know if you're familiar with him personally or, or professionally, Professionally, yes. Okay. So he, in a recent book, uh, I forget the full title, but it's Sustainability Toward a, F a Management Ethic or something. But he makes an interesting point that what we tend to argue about in this intrinsic value or non-intrinsic value debate might be misguided insofar as, philosophically speaking, according to him at least, and he's, he's a philosopher by training, so I, I take his word in this, in this regard, Intrinsic value, quote unquote, value that does not have or does not depend on a valuer, is contentious philosophically to begin with. But um, there is a useful distinction, right, to be made between intrinsic value and something being intrinsically valued. And so Norton appeals to a sort of pluralistic, democratic principle, which, which in theory would respect the segments of society which valued by biodiversity or any other natural resource intrinsically um, without having to claim that it has intrinsic value and then kind of going from there. I, I mean, I thought it was an interesting way to try to resolve a, you know, a dead-end kind of problem, but again, 
I'm sure you've run into this many times and, and have your ideas about whether or not it's, it's a, a worthwhile conversation to get into. Well, I leave it to the, the economists to sort the, these things out because I think when it actually comes <laughs> to the evaluation exercises or the development of real-world policy, right. that probably the, the philosophical and esoteric debates that we ecologists have and the economists have will probably not be of interest to them. Um, I know that in the Millennium Assessment, which was done between 2000 and 2005, that study that was commissioned by the United Nations that had some 1,300 social and natural scientists working together on the problem of what the state of the planet was, mm -hmm. that in the Biodiversity Synthesis Report, um, the economists decided that there would be a certain amount of value to humans that would occur if we were just basically focusing on all of the other values, but there would be an additional um, value to humans if we were to focus on the intrinsic values as well. I mean, the idea being that, um, in a way, we're dragging the intrinsic value as something that if we made uh, an eye towards to using that as our arguments for conservation, that the end product would be something that winds up being of greater value to people. Exactly. So you might imagine that the preservation of a rainforest that includes the idea of intrinsic value might lead to a rainforest that actually looks nicer and has more appeal culturally to people than one which did not take that into its deliberations. Right. That's a good so what point. they were doing was tying the intrinsic value ultimately to the other values and then leaving it there. I must say that in the diagram they showed, they left a very, very tiny fraction of biological diversity's value to intrinsic value, something like you know, uh, 2 or 3% of the entire graph. Really? Well, okay. Intrinsic. But of course, nobody really knows what that is or how to measure it. Right. What is that? Is that utils or dollars? Right. But that's interesting. So it's saying it's not a matter so much of either or as this and that kind of coincide, I guess. Right. Great. So a couple more questions on, on this front. Uh, and this is also a pretty broad ranging one. You mentioned that climate change will have effects on, um, on how biodiversity functionally speaking, uh, works. Can you just tell us a little bit about the directions in which climate change might affect just biodiversity globally and also biodiversity conservation on multiple levels? Well, there have been a number of uh, reports that have tried to remind people working in climate change that biological diversity is an important part of the picture. We had published a paper in Science a few years back in which we argued that the diversity of a rainforest tells you a great deal about how much carbon it's going to sequester. And that just simply treating a rainforest as a patch of green trees doesn't tell you as much as what exactly the species are in there and who's actually sequestering carbon more than others and who retains that carbon for a longer period of time. Um, there have been, um, even the IPCC has had, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has had specific reports that have pointed out the importance of biological diversity of climate change. And the Carta Syracusa, which was the meeting of the G8 environmental ministers issued a proclamation before the, um, the, the Denmark conference, that big, that big uh, COP15 meeting or conference of the parties meeting right. in Denmark that was on the television and newspapers for so long, that, you know, before you start deliberating about biological diversity, I mean, about, sorry, about climate change and about carbon and about taxes and so forth, that remember that you have to include the natural world as part of this picture. Mm -hmm. But if you've seen some of the proceedings of um, COP15 or the Climate Change Conference in Denmark, that really I don't think it ever came up. I don't think uh, you know, mm -hmm. that it was that um, uh, considered in the large part of the deliberations they had. Yes. Now that's interesting because if you get the leaders of the G8 countries together, they will mostly talk about the importance of climate change through reasons of energy and for reasons of disease transmission and for reasons right. of rising co of, uh, 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 lo loss of coastlines because right. of rising sea levels. But they don't talk about biological diversity. And yet, if you get the environmental ministers of the G8, they say that biological diversity is really important to climate change for reasons which scientists have known for some time. And um, I wonder, you know, what to do about that. For example, the Conference of the Parties on the Convention on Biological Diversity, mind you, the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity and the United Nations Framework on Climate Change were both established in the Rio conference in, in 1992 at the same time. So they're sort of like twins mm -hmm. separated at birth. And yet, the <laughs> and given of different the amounts of resources. Were, was that very, very different resources? <laughs> I don't think I saw anything on television or even much in the news about the conference of the parties 
on the Convention on Biological Diversity yeah. compared to the extreme